Uh, good afternoon. I am Elizabeth Cohen. I would like to welcome you all to the final event in the Maxwell School's 2009-2010 uh, State of Democracy Lecture Series. I want to thank all of you for joining us today to hear Professor Laura Nader speak. Let me begin by expressing um, collective gratitude to the Maxwell School, to the Campbell Institute and its director, Grant Rear, for their ongoing support of the series. I also want to thank our Campbell staff, Bethany Wallowender and Kelly Coleman, for their dedication to the series. Please be sure to uh, look for announcements of next year's speakers coming soon on the Campbell Institute website, as well as archives of Campbell Conversations interviews with our speakers. As is our usual practice, today's talk will run for about 40 minutes. Professor Nader will then take questions from the audience, and following the Q&A, you are all invited to continue the discussion more informally at a reception outside the hallway. Um, I would like to remind all of you when you're asking your questions to wait for the microphone to come to you. Um, that way you will uh, be recorded, uh, and if otherwise we will not be able to hear your voice when you ask your uh, questions. So before we begin, let me give a brief introduction to our speaker. Professor Laura Nader is Professor of Anthropology at the University of California at Berkeley. She received her BA in Latin American Studies from Wells College and a PhD in Anthropology from Radcliffe College. Professor Nader is the author of a trove of books on subjects including anthropology of the law, law, culture, and society, and the challenges of meeting our energy needs responsibly. I'm not going to list all of her titles because you can find out more by buying one of them. Plunder, when the rule of law is illegal, following the talk directly outside of the auditorium. There's a table set up right there. In her written work, Professor Nader has critiqued topics as diverse as harmony ideology, trustanoia, that's the opposite of paranoia, and Western cultural and economic domination. She has also issued an extremely influential clarion call for anthropologists to, in her words, study up, to study oppressors as well as the oppressed, the affluent and affluent, as well as the impoverished and poverty, and so on and so forth. She is, in brief, a scholar activist whose interests could not speak more directly to the issues consuming public attention in the United States, and I will add this very campus on this very day. For her erudite and principled scholarship, Professor Nader has been honored by the Law and Society Association with the Harry Calvin Prize and the American Anthropological Association with the Distinguished Lecture Award. If it isn't already clear why I'm so pleased to welcome Laura Nader today, I'll add a brief footnote. In 1989, as a sophomore in a suburban New Jersey high school that my father had aptly named the Bourgeois Hothouse, I began my career as an inviter of speakers. My first somewhat overly ambitious invitation went out to Laura's brother, Ralph, who I am delighted to report generously agreed to come and speak to my high school classmates, and they needed to hear what he had to say. It is therefore a personal and a professional pleasure to offer the podium all these years later to yet another talented and vocal member of the Nader family. So please join me in welcoming Professor Laura Nader. Thank you very much, Dr. Cohen, for that nice introduction and for inviting me. Um, I went to Wells College, which is just on Lake Cayuga, so I spent many years going through Syracuse on the way to Aurora and on the way back from Aurora to Connecticut. And it was um, um, a pleasure sometimes to come here and go through the factories that you no longer have uh, because that was the building block of uh, industrial America started in places just like this. So thank you. Uh, the quote for this talk is that of my father. Uh, if you want to spread democracy, you have to be one. And people always take a double take on that. First they smile, and then they look sort of worried. My father was a man who came to this country from the Levant, an area that was war-torn war -torn, under the rule of the Ottomans for several hundred years, and then to be mandated after World War II by French colonizers. 
He had a choice to stay in Lebanon and resist a colonial power or to leave. Those were his choices. My father had lost his own father in infancy. He had a mother and sister for whom he felt responsible to support. So he chose to come to the land of the free and the brave, the United States. He took his new country seriously, and democratic ideology and practice was his life. The democratic solution for new immigrants then, as compared to now, was an orchestrated heterogeneity, which in his day was called the melting pot. My father interpreted the melting pot as taking the best from where you come from, in this case a healthy skepticism, and the best from the United States to build a continuing healthy democracy. The twin forces, imperialism and colonialism, on one side, democracy on the other, was always part of our dinner table conversation, as well as a part of his busy place of business on the main street in a New England mill town, Winston, Connecticut. The local issues concerning him were the mills and their local ownership and the looming takeover of regional capitalism by the trusts. And so we grew up with debates over empire, corporate capitalism, democracy a la Tom Paine's common sense, and Jeffersonian democratic philosophies, much of which, you might be surprised to know, permeated the Arabic newspapers of the day as an antidote to colonialism. The Arab League and the, pan the Pan-Arab movement was founded on the basis of a model of a United Arab States, like the United States of America. We were raised then to respect critical and independent thinking. We were not ists in the usual sense. At that time, there were predominantly de Democratic Party members as well as Republican Party voters, but also a great number of independent voters. So I wasn't a bit surprised at what happened in Massachusetts this past uh, fall. We could vote as independents. We could register as independents. And later, my father, in response to the two-party sidelining of independence on the ballot, took the case of ballot access all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court and lost. When asked if he thought there should be a third party in this country, he responded, I'd settle for two, <laughs> indicating his belief that we were dealing with one tree, two branches, as he put it. That, too, stayed with us. Along these same lines, he believed that the rule of law was the cornerstone of political democracy. My two brothers studied law, and I became an anthropologist of law. Not surprising. The role of the family and family traditions can be very important. This is one of the reasons I oppose preschool, such early preschool as two years old, but very important family traditions. It was so important, even in the Soviet Union, that they didn't believe a child a Russian child should go to school until they were six. Now, I want to shift from this personal to a work, a very brave work, written by an anthropologist named Demetra Dukas. It was published by Cornell University Press in 2003, and it was called Worked Over, The Corporate Sabotage of an American Community, a brilliant book completely sidelined by American anthropologists and most people in general, except for me, I assign it to my class all the time. <laughs> Worked over was an honest inquiry into what has gone wrong in the land of the free and the home of the brave. It could have been my hometown. Let me give you an introduction by looking at her first two paragraphs. She says, it is a curious kind of democracy we live in where the largest political party in the United States is the non-voters. But is non-voting so irrational in a society where decisions of any consequence are made, in quotes, above our heads by great wealth, allied with the photogenic politicians we may choose in election day ritual? This book looks at how a great democratic project went wrong when the resources of a nation, material and cultural, were gathered up in the hands of a few giant corporations. 
This is not a book, she says, of large-scale statistical arguments and famous people. It studies the corporate ascendancy from the perspective of ordinary people in central New York State manufacturing region, how they used to live and how they live now and what happened to them. Dukas describes her book as being about corporate Americanism, which I think is something we might take to heart because when I go abroad uh, and I'm attacked for being an American, which is increasingly happening to many of us, I say there are two Americas. There is the Jeffersonian American, and then there is the corporate American. And they're different, and one conquered the other. And what's happening in your country, you can imagine, it could happen elsewhere and happened in our country. That's what her book is about. It's about how a cultural revolution, and I, she calls it that, and it's, that's what it is, a cultural revolution, which is still spreading, the cultural revolution of the gospel of wealth, replacing the gospel of work, which meant the superiority of capital over labor. Her story about how the trust tightened their grip in community after community, communities who lost hold of the enterprises they had built with their own hands for their own prosperity. How could others claim the fruit of all their labor, their own and their children's future prosperity? She says, from day one, the threat of factory closing was the trust's blunt instrument of political conquest. From the trust's perspective, the people needed a dose of re-education, basically propaganda. Corporate contempt for democracy was the turn of the day at the turn of the last century. One Judge O'Connor, she cites, thundered at a political meeting, why are politicians corrupt? Because big business has made them so, she answered. The robber barons, they were called. The critical mechanisms was the law, bankruptcy law, trust lawyers, monopoly makers. So her story is a 100-year transition from regional capitalism to corporate capitalism. So when people talk about capitalism as if it were one thing, we need to remember that Sol Tax of the University of Chicago once wrote a book called Penny Capitalism. It was about market capitalism among Guatemalan indigenous people. And he wrote it because people thought at that time that the people, the indigenous people were a bunch of commies because they held land in common. So he wrote Penny Capitalism. So capitalism is not just capitalism. There is a difference, which Dukas outlines beautifully, between regional capitalism, where it's built regionally, with regional hands, the people that own the factory stayed there, their kids went to school with everybody else, and corporate capitalism at a distance, basically, which is a very different animal. So 100 years of transition between these two different animals, which was the story of hundreds of New England mill towns, if there were hundreds. Interestingly, Dimitra Dukas didn't get hired by an anthropology department in this country. She got hired in Canada, much more open to such thinking, I guess. Let me jump at this point to corporate capitalism and the corporation as a person. And I have to do this because I was told originally I had a half an hour to talk. So I'm doing it in sort of vignette jumps. There's a legal historian named Robert Gordon who made the point that for American progressives generally, the most conspicuous example of changes was incremental. The persistence through the late 19th and 20th century of the habitual consciousness, he says, of private market and business oriented individualism. Within that context, one can see the idea of the corporation as a person evolving. Another scholar, Willard Hurst, noted, it was the existence of the Supreme Court, and he said this about 20 years ago, which provided the means to define and enforce values of the corporate style of business, which can be realized only through law above and beyond the sovereignty of any one state to wit the most recent Supreme Court decision in January 2010 with regard to corporate personhood and freedom. 
the rise of corporate individuals, a convenient legal fiction, comes at the cost of dispossessing large bodies of real people. And in a recent statement by both Public Citizen and other organizations like Move to Amend uh, dot organize. They have the movement now. We, the people of the United States of America, reject the U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in Citizens United. We call for a constitutional amendment that will abolish corporate personhood. Human beings, not corporations or other entities, are persons entitled to constitutional rights, and they want to establish that money is not speech, guarantee the right to vote and to participate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Some years ago, when I was up in British Columbia talking, uh, the corporations in Vancouver actually tried to get the right to vote as a person in Vancouver. Well, of course, they could buy all the elections. And they were up in arms in Vancouver. There was a reaction to the Supreme Court um, decision. And there will be continued reactions, and it will grow, I'm sure. But it's so outrageous that Judge, um, I'm blanking, the, the, the uh, the, the Supreme Court justice that just resigned. Stevens. Stevens. Judge Stevens. Judge Stevens is a Republican appointee. He voted against yeah. it, of course, and he, he was shocked at what was happening and that that could happen in the court. But that gives you some idea of how the court has moved, in, the, in which direction, and also whether it matters whether the appointee is a Republican appointee or a Democratic appointee. Because after all, Souter also was a Republican appointee. People change their mind as a result of being on the court. And so it is, and so it will be. Let's jump to another author who is interesting to us. This is Charles Wright. How many of you have heard of Charles Wright? Greening of America, Yale law professor, distinguished Yale law professor. Wrote in 1995 about this economic government that Demetra Dukas is talking about. His book is called Opposing the System. He published the book. It was not well received by the media, and it disappeared almost as soon as it came out. On the dust jacket were the following words. We need constitutional curbs on corporate tyranny, a restored social contract that protects economic justice and personal security, and a resurgent protest government Move, protest movement guided by a new map of reality. Now, that was not the first time I'd heard the notion of economic government. My older brother always spoke about and used that term, not Ralph, but Schaff. Uh, but it's the first time I ever saw in print the need for a new map of reality, suggesting that we are living a map of unreality. And, of course, it was very, very much uh, opposed. And actually... He said to a member of our family, Charles Wright, he didn't understand why he never realized the economic government when he was, reading, when he was writing Greening of America, that it was right in his face and he didn't realize it, which is why we always need people from other parts of the world to come and study us. We go readily and are very generous to study other people, but we need other people like de Tocqueville and so forth to come and study us. After all, Myrdal, when he came, got going with the civil rights movement as a result. It was an outsider who came and said, you got segregation here. And we never wanted to admit segregation. Go to Washington, D.C., you go on a tour, they're not going to show you half of Washington, D.C. Recently, a Venezuelan, a Venezuelan phot photographer has put out a book called In the Shadow of Power about the other Washington, D.C. Powerful photographs for a country. Three blocks from the World Bank you find the worst poverty. And of course, the World Bank is telling countries all over the world, do what we say and you too will be, you too will be rich. But there we are, three blocks from the White House. Rice said there are two maps he talked about, the existing map and the opposing map. So you could say the, the real left wing and the real, the real right wing and the real left wing, whatever that is anymore. I don't know what right is and left is anymore. The existing map, he says, is the result of what the 19th century trusts called a dose of re-education. Imagine that, re-education. Up until then, we were doing writing, writing, and reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? In the existing map, private and public are opposed. 
whereby the private individual and the giant corporation, the two of them, for them, freedom is lumped. They're lumped together, and they're, they're the ones who lead us to freedom, which is why you can get evangelicals who really have different positions than most large corporations lumped with, they lump themselves with the corporations um, as you know, the, the, the answer to a free, the free world. Freedom in this map is to be found outside of government, creating the illusion of common ground between individuals and private corporations. Now this idea raised the corporate free market or free enterprise to a sacred status equal to democracy itself, an invisible private government. I'll get more on that in a minute. This thinking assumes a boundary between public government and corporate government, unlike the emergent term corporatocracy, which denies that and says, you know, corporatocracy, we're a corporatocracy, not a democracy. An opposing map, Reich argues, makes possible a debate which is what we need in this country. We need argument and debate, civil argument and debate. Unlike the mantra we're hearing about bipartisan, a debate would allow for a map of reality to emerge. What did this democracy ever achieve through bipartisan? The American Revolution was not bipartisan. The Civil War was not bipartisan. Women's rights were not bipartisan. Civil rights was not bipartisan. All of this is part of the debate that makes our country uh, work. Now, in a corporatocracy, leaders believe that democracy is linked to a type of economic system, corporate capitalism. And such a notion goes back, way back in our history, but Woodrow Wilson, President Woodrow Wilson, um, has embodied it. The most wonderful quote I found <laughs> in a book called The Irresistible Empire, written by a Columbia University historian. Um, in 1916, President Woodrow Wilson addressed a convention hall on the First World's Salesmanship Congress. All Europe was at war, and de America's democracy of business had to take the lead in the struggle for the peaceful conquest of the world. Peaceful conquest of the world. This is what he said to the, to the salesman. Let your thoughts and your imagination run abroad throughout the whole world and with the inspiration of the thought that you are Americans and are meant to carry liberty and justice and the principles of humanity wherever you go. Go out and sell goods that will make the world more comfortable and more happy and convert them to the democratic principles of America. So... With that background, it's no surprise that after 9-11, President Bush said, <gasps> what did he say? Go shopping. And I wondered at the time, go shopping? Good for America, go shopping. Enter President George W. In the name of who, by the way, the, the so-called left, the so-called left, always made fun of President George W. Bush. And I used to say to my class, I will not tolerate that kind of making fun. Because this guy shows, along with 12 people, that you can change the world. And he did. So you may think he's dumb, but in fact, he changed the world. Maybe forever. In the name of democracy and rule of law, the American public was persuaded of the moral acceptability of military aggression and occupation of Iraq based on a lie. Weapons of mass destruction. There were no methods of, methods of mass destruction. It was not a war declared by Congress. There hasn't been a war declared by Congress since World War II. If there were, it would have been debated. That's where Reich is right. We need argument and we need debate. Lying is more than deception, one scholar said. The liar wants the unreal to be accepted as actuality. Untruth becomes a reality. 
to keep on repeating it. Mark Twain, a liar gets to believe their own lies, becomes a mantra. We know some people who did that in Europe. Hitler was good at it, so was his, his henchmen, Goebbels and so forth. When the U.S. invaded Iraq, speaking of outsiders observing us, Tanzanian legal scholar Arisa Shivji wrote the, wrote, he was supposed to be going to a conference in England, and he decided not to go. He decided in opposition to the war, he would just write a piece that appears on electronic publication. He wrote, uh, he was really very articulate and very generous, actually. He said, the moral, moral rehabilitation of imperialism was first and foremost ideological, constructed on neoliberal economic principles, free market, privatization, liberalization, human rights, NGOs, good governance, multiple party democracy, rule of law, they were all rolled in together. You couldn't take one, understand one from the other. He said, U.S. foreign policy becomes active intervention to secure for our merchandise and our capitalists opportunity for profitable investment. U.S. power today is associated with a powerful military leading to resource wars. And you know, you've heard about that from political scientist Claire. Democracy versus empire, oil in Iraq. What's in Afghanistan? Anybody? Lithium. Lithium. Batteries. It's got more lithium in Afghanistan and um, right when they're about to go into Kandahar. That's where it is, all that area. It's got Bolivia and, and uh, Afghanistan have the most. And of course, we're talking about battery cars, battery operated cars and so forth becomes important. So in this context, oil or lithium or anything else becomes a national security issue, argument for going to war. Once you link the two, now we jump to Iraq. Paul Bremer. The Congress didn't send Paul Bremer to Iraq. He was sent by George W. Bush, his personal emissary, Co Coalition Provisional Authority. Amazing. That's what got me interested in writing this book, Plunder, along with the outrage. Our newspapers were pounding us with rule of law. We have to take, because when, when the weapons of mass destruction didn't appear, then rule of law was the mantra. Rule of law, we have to take rule of law to Iraq. Rule of law, rule of law, rule of law. And everybody believed, yes, we must save the Iraqi soul. We'll take rule of law to Iraq. And we save their women, too. And of course, under Saddam Hussein, dictator that he was, the situation for women was very good because he had to liberate women in order to get rid of the tribal war chiefs. So how did he liberate them? He sent them to university. They became engineers. There are more women students of engineering at the University of Baghdad than there were men when we went into Iraq. Doctors, lawyers, all kinds of things, deans of law schools and so forth. So um, here we are with uh, Paul Bremer, goes there, and he writes 100 edicts. It's like the Roman Empire. And if there are 500 pages of edicts, they're all on, you can get them on your internet. Unbelievable. It, it could have happened 500 years ago, if you read what they say. The privatization of Iraqi oil wells, they figured out, would help weaken OPEC. So. 500 pages. The political and economic invasion and now occupation of Iraq by the U.S. military and corporations appear as 100 orders, the handover that wasn't. The Bremer orders gave preference to U.S. corporations in the development of Iraqi economy intended to change Iraq from a centrally planned economy to a market economy. Now, that, that's illegal. According to international law since the Hague regulations of 1907 and the Geneva Conventions, an occupying nation cannot transform a defeated society into its own likeness. And that's what we were doing. Give me a sample. Order number 39 allowed for the privatization of Iraq's 200 state-owned enterprises. 100% foreign ownership of Iraqi business. 
national treatment of foreign firms, unrestricted tax remittance of all profits and other funds, and 40-year ownership licenses. Order number 40 changes the banking sector from a state-run to a market-driven system, allowing foreign banks to purchase up to 50% of Iraqi banks. Order number 17 grants foreign contractors full immunity from Iraq's laws. Injured parties must be brought to the U.S. courts and so on and so forth, and we know the Blackwater deal. So, but oil is the issue. By February 2007, the Iraqi cabinet approves a draft of oil law that would shift the balance of power in Iraqi oil and gas management from the central government to the regions. And Rashid Khalidi says this reverses everything that's happened in the Middle East since 1901. So, okay, a missed opportunity to bring American democracy and rule of law to the Middle East. A missed opportunity. As was Saddam Hussein's mockery of a trial. That was, a, that was an opportunity to show him what a real trial and democratic style would be. That didn't happen. And all of this is after, under Clinton, sanctions, 500,000 Iraqi children died which is more than Nagasaki, Hiroshima. Nobody even knows that. We wonder why they hate us, right? They hate us because we're rich or they hate us because we have democracy. No, they have reason. It's amazing they don't hate us more, one could argue. So a million Iraqi dead, some people say, 800,000 to a million, whatever. And people displaced, refugees, etc. We have the war on terror. We become a warfare state and all of these acts of plunder are hiding behind the construction of a new foe for the civilized nations. I mean, all you have to do is listen to Hillary Clinton. The arrogance, the hubris of this woman talking about other, other peoples elsewhere. It's, it just takes you back. There are certain things that come in and out of our society if citizens are, don't have their eyes open. A couple of more things, and then I'll open it for discussion. Let's come home. It's not just Iraqis that are suffering. The War on the Bill of Rights, Patriot Act, Homeland Security Act, and a variety of presidential orders, signings, and so forth, a revolutionary moment. And only the political scientists have really studied the signings. Interesting enough, they haven't been of interest to anybody. I mean, I collected all the signings from George Washington to the present, and it's very interesting. You can see the up and downs in numbers and who does and who doesn't and what they sign for and, and so forth. They're not all bad, but you can do all kinds of things that are not very democratic if the executive branch has undue influence. A revolutionary moment, a domestic revolution, a rule of law that's not a rule of law, and the U.S. becomes a model of crony democracy. The only opposition to the Patriot Act in the Congress was Russ Feingold, a Democrat from Wisconsin. The war on the Bill of Rights has turned now into a war on dissent, affecting libraries, who have to tell who uses their books, families, who are American citizens that are taken out and so forth, foreigners, immigrants, and yes, students in the university all around. At California, we've had a revolution over the question of student conduct. All of a sudden, people are now point, looking at student conduct hearings around the country. The students at Berkeley and all the other campuses objected to 32% increase from one semester to another in, in tuition raises, and they objected nonviolently. And the students were chanting, we are not violent, you are violent, to the sheriff's office. And the sheriff's office, the sheriff's police were violent. And why the chancellor chose to call them in, I don't know. Uh, because he was terrified. He had some idea that these students were all a bunch of red, you know, pink or whatever, terrorists or whatever, right? And they were totally non-ideological. They were very, very nice kids, very interesting to watch this group, very different from the 1960s. And they just, they sort of had been raised to believe in the system. 
The system being the ideology of democracy rather than the practice of democracy. And terrible things have been happening at Berkeley. And the students are really kind of stunned, not only at the violence, the police bashing their hands, destroying this, that, and the other thing, uh, attacking a faculty member because he put his hand on the barrier, uh, you know, tackling him, putting him in handcuffs, arresting him. I mean, you know, this is America. In the student conduct hearings, there's one guy who was coming home, a student in sociology, you probably read about this, he was coming home from the library at night, 11.30 at night, and he got sort of mixed up with the people that were going to the chancellor's house that knocked off the urns and so on. And he got arrested because everybody else fled. And they took him to Santa Rita and they put him in solitary confinement. Somehow he got a message to his parents. They were celebrating their 40th wedding anniversary. They got on a plane and came to Berkeley. had to pay $10,000 to get him out, which they don't get back, by the way, for legal reasons. And then when the student conduct, when his he was, this case was dismissed by the judge, there was no charges. Besides, there was a professor sitting in his office watching all this 1130 at night when he was writing letters of recommendation. And uh, so, and the father came to the hearings with a lawyer. The lawyer and the father were not allowed in the hearings. So due process became an issue. A couple of the law students got involved. One law professor got involved. The other law professors just you know, think it's just, it's not trivia. This should not happen. Dissent should not be punished that way in a democratic society. Now, in every society, the things happen. But you have to respond to them to get things back on track. And if you don't, then you lose more, and you lose more, and you lose more, and you lose it incrementally. The chilling effect. Another chilling effect. A book written by Dave Eggers. I don't know how many of you read this, called Zaytun. How many of you have read this? Anybody heard about it? Zaytun? It's an incredible book. And Dave Eggers is such a good writer. Zaytun in Arabic means olives. And the man who was the centerpiece of this story's name, last name was Zaytun. And it's about Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. And it's about an immigrant who became an American, just like my father and mother did. And it's a description of Guantanamo on the mainland. Now, this man comes from maritime family in Syria. Um, somehow, he ends up in the United States. Somehow, he ends up being, he, he's really an optimistic guy. And he becomes a, a cons, in the construction business in New Orleans. And he's known all over New Orleans. Everybody loves him because he's sociable and so on. Everybody knew Zaytun. And so when the flood came, he decided to stay and sent his wife and family out. Now, he happens to be Muslim, happens to be. And what was he doing as the flood, floodwaters rose? He remembered that he had a rubber boat, and he sort of kept raising his furniture and everything up onto the top of the roof, and the boat too, and he decided to take his boat and start rescuing people, and animals, I might add, because they left their animals and they're barking and so on. And so here's this guy who's rescuing and trying to do some good in the country of his choice and believing in the democratic process. And at one point, some CIA agents and police and National Guard come into his, the one place where they still had a phone, and they arrest him as a bunch of terrorists. And they give him the Guantanamo treatment right there. And then his wife didn't hear from him. She didn't know what happened. And she then, you know, he was in a maximum security jail finally. And the only thing that saved him, ironically, was a missionary that came to the jail, wanted to teach him the Bible, and he was Muslim, and that was, made it worse because he was a devout Muslim, so he prayed in, in the jail, and, and that was terribly you know, anti-American. And um, so uh, he said to the missionary, please call my wife, this is her number. And fortunately, the missionary did. If he hadn't, he would have been a disappeared right here in the US. So the interesting story, and the most interesting part about it, is guess what he did after he got out of jail? He went back to rebuild New Orleans. The spirit of the immigrant. We forget that immigrants are more than just troubles for this country. We're all immigrants in this country. And he's rebuilding New Orleans. Who can believe it? Meanwhile, his wife is suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. 
So Sheldon Wolin, a political scientist, wrote a book called Democracy Incorporated, and I'll try and wind up with this. And anything else I'll put in to the questions. Democracy Incorporated describes a managed democracy and the specter of what he calls inverted totalitarianism. Uh, the opposition to constitutional democracy here, that a democracy that now is obsessed with control, expansion, superiority, that is American exceptionalism and supremacy. He portrays a country where citizens are politically uninterested and submissive, where the public is shepherded, not sovereign, managed, managed by unchecked economic power. He asks what causes a democracy to change into some non or anti-democratic system and what kind of system is democracy likely to change into? His answer is away from self-government, away from the rule of law, away from egalitarianism and public decision-making towards managed democracy, the smiling faces of inverted totalitarianism, a politics of dumbed-down public discourse, a powerful state, a fading democracy. He's, democracy, he says, is about truth-telling, not lying. Lying is more than deception. It creates unreality. And he gets into WMDs, trade agreements, portrayed as win-win when, in fact, they're shrinking our sovereignty and so forth. Um, under this kind of a world, in this kind of a world, ballot access goes against American dual, politi dual pol pol parties. Iran becomes the biggest threat to nuclear proliferation, although Israeli submarine Nuclear submarines are pointing their guns at Iran. Nobody talks about that. Leave no child behind becomes testing rather than education. That's the re-education. Protest is un-American or not supporting our troops. War becomes an executive prerogative, not an issue up for debate in Congress. There are a lot of ideas for citizen action. Um, not only Wolin's Dem Democracy Incorporated, you could look at Ralph Nader's The Good Fight, Tom Paine's Common Sense from 1776, and so forth. The point here is that the theory and practice of democracy is hopelessly out of line. Free enterprise, yet vast and crushing monopolies. Yet in spite of all of this, the democratic vision that we gave to the world is believed in different parts of the world today. So, as the Australian political scientist once said at Berkeley, democracy in Euro-America is being reduced and in other parts of the world it's increasing. And that's because of our vision. We've excited the rest of the world. The cult of the average man. Like when these guys were asked in the New Haven bars, should Ralph Nader run for office? They said, he can do what he wants, it's a free country. <laughs> this was a vision we give to the world. It exists everywhere, still, including China. China's interesting in this regard, because if you look at the protests in China today, there are a huge number of protests, about 200 every week, all over the place. And what do they use as a model of what they want? Aaron Brockovich. They use it to tackle, by, through litigation, the polluting of the rivers uh, and so on and so forth that's happening in China. And when President Obama went to China and talked to the young people, one girl said, in your country, you're lucky because you have two things we don't have. You have democracy and you have higher public education. Both things that we are destroying. Why would we destroy the one thing that we're admired for, or the two things that we're admired for everywhere in the world? Public higher education, the dream of people in the third world, free. Not free here, but good here. Free in Latin American countries. Free in some European countries. But at least it's good quality here. University of California, Berkeley, right, rated one of the top, if not the top, public institutions. So we have given the world a vision that they're excited about. And it can be very exciting for the planet if we go back and tie it into practice and take the term re-education that was used by the trusts in the 19th century 
to re-educate our own people. Now, the reverse is happening in Texas, those of you who've looked at what they're doing to textbooks. They want to clean the textbooks. They want to take out John and Abigail Adams. They want to take out the suffrage advocates. They want to take out um, the, the, the Clara Barton, founder of the Red Cross. Uh, they want to take out you know, all kinds of things in Jeffersonian democracy from the textbooks in Texas. And people are amazed. So Wright is right in saying, changing the system requires first an intelligent diagnosis of what is wrong, a vision how things could be better, and we are being thwarted because of the unreal map of reality, a false map of reality, and a map of reality that traps us in our present predicament. The expert knows best and so forth, and we need to change this and, uh, and so that we can proceed. It's not very complicated. The example I give to my students that resonates with them there was a pilot in Washington, D.C. at what's now called Reagan, I guess it's called Ronald Reagan Airport. And um, he saw ice on the wings. So he then calls up to the, to the, what do you call them, the people that are in charge. Right. And he says to them, uh, should I fly? I see ice on the wings. They said, no, it's clear. He saw with his eyes, but he believed the experts. And he flew and he crashed and everybody died. And that, that example to the class is to meant to indicate, if you see with your own eyes what's happening, say so. So maybe we should start a movement for frank talk about the emperor and his clothes and improve things. Thank you very much. As I say to my students, give me a hard time. You always learn more. What? There you have somebody up there. Benito Mussolini. Yeah. Benito Mussolini was one asked was once asked, what's fascism? And he said it was the merging of the corporations and the government. Would you say that's the situation we have in the United States today? That's what FDR said in 1936. I can give you the quote, but I'll take the next question. It's a great quote, actually. This is what he said. A new basis for maybe it's not in this quote, for security and prosperity, the right to a job, et cetera, et cetera, the right to adequate medical care, the right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age sickness, but the right to a good education. You know, somewhere else he said that. He said exactly that. Maybe that's where, he, maybe that's where Mussolini got it. <laughs> Does it seem like an adequate map of reality? Well, I mean, look what's happened, look what's happened with the medical um, debate in Washington over medical care. Um, they basically said there's need bipartisan. There is two positions here. And both positions were, were insurance company positions. And they took single payer off the table. They wouldn't even debate it. And they said it was a debate. It wasn't a debate. It was they're both insurance, both, both pro-insurance, the Republicans and the Democrats. So what do you call that, right? Hi, I've got a couple of questions. I'm right here. <laughs> right here. Okay. <laughs> I taught a course last year on Obama's first 100 days, and my students then were very excited about the election. And um, I think some of that excitement may have waned now. And, and part of the charm of Obama, I call him the persuader in chief, is that his rhetoric is so powerful, and yet we seem to still be doing a lot of the things wrong that you've just talked about. So I'd love to hear your take on this Obama effect because you... Well, at Berkeley, you know, uh, Berkeley's knee-jerk. Uh, and, of course, they all work for Obama and 
Democrats and so on. And uh, it's not left at all. Don't get, ever get the idea that Berkeley is to the left. It's not. It's just centrist Democrat. All right, so they were all happy. And uh, all the sorority and fraternity kids are running across campus yelling, we did it, we did it. And they were all white, of course. And uh, next day, one of the black graduate students comes in and he said, describes the situation to me. And he said, I want, he said, it's disgusting. I said, what's disgusting? Who's we and what's it? And the only people that complained about that were the black students on campus. And then the chancellor got up and said, you know, isn't it wonderful? We now have, you know, a black president. And he didn't notice that in the Senate there's only one black faculty member. So uh, one of my students then wrote a paper on how I got conned by Barack Obama. Uh, no specifics no, in, the, in, the, in his talk. Hope, fear, hope, fear, fear, hope, hope, fear, you know. No specifics at all. And you can't believe the things that people wanted to believe about him, which he didn't even say. Actually, he's doing a lot of the things he said he was going to do. He said he was going to go into Afghanistan. You think any of the people that voted for him say, well, he's responsible for more civilian deaths the first year than, than, uh, than George W. Bush in Afghanistan? Nobody wants to see the reality. Talk about reality. Now, let's say you voted for Obama, and you got him in office and so on at least push him and make him do what you want him to do. They just voted for him and left him. And who do you think is in Washington? The corporations, the insurance companies, and the bankers, and the Wall Street, and so on. So if you vote for someone like that, like Roosevelt said, make me do it. And Obama even said those words. Because if you don't make him do it in the first 100 days... Now, he didn't exactly reach out to people either, because he was totally surrounded. And he never re reached out to public interest or anything. So... It's, uh, it, it can either create cynicism or some sense of, I mean, that's the sad part. It will create, it has created cynicism. People say, well, and, and then less people will vote next time. And what are our choices going to be? So the reason you have third party efforts or fourth party or fifth party, I mean, how do we ever get to this duopoly anyway? The reason you have those efforts, not necessarily to win, is to get the conversation going, for God's sake. So that you can challenge the, the lying, plain and simple, the lying. Now, Americans don't know what to do with lies. They know what to do in Latin America because they expect lies in Latin America. <laughs> Americans are gullible. They, don't, they, they trust. They can't believe that somebody who's in public office is going to lie to them. They're beginning to learn. But slowly, they can't believe everybody that I know in Latin America said 2000 was a coup. You think Americans wouldn't know a coup if they saw it? It was a coup. The Supreme Court had no legal right to choose the president. But they chose the president. But as I said, it was a double coup. The double coup was they blamed Ralph for it, <laughs> which was a lie. But they got rid of Nader and the public interest movement. They basically killed the public interest movement at that point. So they don't, they don't get invited to, to Congress, and they don't get invited to, to so on and so forth. So it was a huge success from one point of view, and a devastating from a democratic point of view. Can I ask one more question? You teach a course that is very popular where you ask students to confront, I think, some of their own lies that are propagated on them? No, it's not. I teach a course called Controlling Processes. Very popular course. It's got about two to 300 people every year from all over the campus. And it starts basically with a Brave New World in 1984 um, and gets them to list the controlling processes there. And by the time they do that, because they've all read them, but they don't really understand they, don't, they, they read it as a story, but then when you have to analyze the controlling processes, then you get the, you know, the nitty-gritty. And what happens when they get the nitty-gritty is, holy mackerel, then they see a film like The Day After Trinity, The Making of the Bomb, and they can see that it was a cult, cultish. They, they were isolated from their families in Los Alamos. They, you know, they, the gadget became the main thing they were concerned about. And anyway, we go through the whole thing. We get into professionalism, how it happened, 100 years about covering the same sort of time as Dukas does. And at the end, they have to pick a controlling process in their life and show how it works. 
It's not a course in theory, it's a course in ethnography, how it works. And that's what's transformative, that they can take this and apply it to their lives. Thank you for that question. Is somebody up there that's had their hand up? Uh, thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk to you. Uh, I worked in the government in Japan since I came to Syracuse, and uh, uh, the concept of democracy in my country is introduced uh, from America after just the war. And uh, I always think the uh, uh, system of democracy, uh, democracy is a system of uh, integrating the invisible people's interest. And uh, in the government, I'm already thinking the way of how how to integrate a, a minority's opinion into the majority, uh, because the only government can be on the side of a weak or a minority. But unfortunately, uh, many people misunderstand that democracy just follows the majority. So uh, how, how can government uh, integrate a minority's opinion on the perspective or majority's perspective? Uh, so a min minority needs to, uh, to be authorized to advocate their rights. What do you think of it? Somebody's going to have to help me with that question. Did you get it, Jay? Well, I mean, minority opinion grows incrementally. It doesn't happen suddenly. So you had the populist movements at the turn of the century in this country, and they were implemented 40 years later by FDR, basically. They came, you know, ideas come in slowly, and they influence... The, the majority uh, incrementally. Now, sometimes you can do it much faster than incrementally because uh, and the, you can do that in a dictatorship by propaganda. The one thing I've learned that, that anthropology never taught me, but I was taught by Margaret Singer, who studied cults, is how fast the human mind can change, the fragility of the human mind. So if you've got a dictator like Hitler, he can come in and very fat, or Mussolini or whoever, uh, smooth operator, which is something we have to be worried about because we're, we're, we're gullible. Smooth operators can change things quite fast from a minority to a maximum. Look at this, uh, the film that they did on, on Nader called An Unreasonable Man. shows how over 40 years this country changed from worrying about things like health and, uh, and safe cars and blah, 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 and air and water and so on, to all of a sudden... These are things that Nixon signed. Now the Democrats are right of Nixon. So something has changed in this country over a 40-year period incrementally to the right. So there are various ways to talk about change, and I could, I could, we do talk about it in the, in the Plunder book, and we could talk maybe afterwards. Uh, Laura, hi. John Burdick in Anthropology, and it's a pleasure to have you here. I've long been a fan. Um, I, it seems to me that your characterization of US, the U.S. political system is, in a, a funny, sort of ironic, maybe paradoxical sense, very top-down. And you're talking about, you know, the federal level, the state, and, and I think that there's a lot of, you know, truth in what you're saying. But in order to characterize the United States, don't we also have to talk about what's happening at the municipal level, at the local level? I mean, is there... Is there no redemption? I mean, we have no, I mean, talk about the nature of the political process at those levels to try to understand to what extent we have some hope for the development and the construction of a democratic culture and society. Yeah, thanks for that question, because that's the only place it's going to come from uh, by the looks of things now. Um, town meetings, I come from New England. We still have town meetings. Uh, some, somebody has done a study of all the town meetings, I think, in New Hampshire or Vermont, uh, wonderful possibilities. It was interesting that in the last decade they were trying to harmonize the town meetings because they thought that that spirit of the town meetings was dangerous in this country, God forbid. You know, you have people that disagree and debate. In our hometown in Winston, Connecticut, we have uh, a basically a, a project on how to create more democratic participation, et cetera, in local issues. And it's and they, they restored uh, ownership of the hospital there that was built, again, by local hands and so on and so forth, but it, it was taken over by some HMO, corruption, blah, 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 and they pulled it back, and they're in the process of, of, try, of trying to keep it. 
So there, there is a lot going on at the local level, but it is, it has been uphill because there has been little boosting of the local level democracy at any level, whether it's local, state, or whatever. So, uh, yes, I, that's exactly where we have to start, and that is where. I'm, I have a book coming out uh, on the energy issue in May. Um, it's called The Energy Reader. And the energy issue may be the way in which we get that stuff started. It is already starting. So you've got um, people getting together on, on uh, Native American reservations, on wind and solar, and you have people taking the gangs in, in, in um, Los Angeles and teaching them how to put on solar panels instead of getting in trouble and going to jail. And you got all kinds of things that would create jobs for, that would also help invigorate the local level. And there's push for energy changes at the local level. That's the major thing I see. Coal is going to be like the anti-coal is going to be like the anti-nuclear movement. It's growing all over the country. And there's going to be all this cover up and so on. You're not going to get this in the press. So if I gave the impression that it's not going to be bottom-up, that's what Dukas' book is all about. It's about the bottom-up look at what's happening from the top down. So thank you for that. Hi. <clears throat> I'm also very grateful that you made your presentation. I'd like to say that you make me optimistic, but I'm not sure that I'm, I'm, I'm there yet. Robert Ashford, and I teach at the law school. Thank you. Um, when we look back, at the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, we, we saw a lot of activity in the universities. Tenure is, we're supposed, we have tenure in order to do important things that w we would not dare do if we didn't have it. It seems to me that's a good standard for tenure. But I'm very depressed about the state of academic freedom in this country, and I don't know whether you would like to comment Thank on, you for that. On, that, uh, on that issue. Yeah. Thanks, Professor Ashford. Um, Professor Ashford's family is about as activist as one can hope to have in areas of science and hopefully law. The, the question for, on that, that's a very discouraging question. Uh, some people say, um, how to answer that. Some people say, um, what happens when you get tenure is you selected the people who are acquiescent, increasingly. So I've been on tenure committees where somebody says, yeah, the work is good, but she's contentious. And I say, so what? That's what a university is about, being contentious. But all of a sudden, the niceness epidemic is making it impossible to be contentious, as it was in the 60s and so on. And that's one area that's coming in. The other area is uh, careerism. Um, nobody at the law school except one nonprofit, one lawyer at, the, at Bolt Hall one who's not tenured cared about this question of, of lack of due process for the students in the, after they got out of jail. One uh, out of a distinguished law school of whatever numbers. They're all careerists now. Even in anthropology, we hire the young ones, they're careerists. The community colleges that I've talked to say we like, we, when we hire anthropologists today, uh, they're all specialists. And, and they used to be more they're careerists. They're specialized. They're too specialists. So the whole specialization thing. In other words, your answer, the answer to your question is a lot of things coming in, on top of which is the corporate university. So you have now the dean of the law school at Berkeley saying we should go on long-distance learning. And, um, and totally CEO. They're CEOs. They're not educators anymore, which causes my colleague R Paul Ravenau to say, you know, the university is finished. And you could say that and you could quit or you could go out yelling and teach it to the students and confront the CEOs and so on. Now, I wrote a letter to, to the UDOF, the president of the University of California. It was a very polite letter in June. Basically, I said, you're new here. Maybe I can help socialize you <laughs> a little bit. Maybe you don't know a little about Berkeley. And I tell them why Berkeley was started and it was public university, give everybody a chance for public, you know, in the 19th century and that we've had some back and forth about this, ups and downs and so on. And I hope that you would understand the culture and that has built this and blah, 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 and so on. And so I put a challenge to him, but I didn't attack him directly. I said, you're ignorant, basically. He didn't answer the letter. Interestingly, faculty are awed by administrators. 
That, to me, is bizarre. Anthropologists used to study awe, right? <laughs> so he didn't answer me by, by October. I sent him the letter back, and I wrote it at the top that uh, politeness requires that you answer letters from faculty. Guess what? I got a letter right away. Mailed letter, not emailed or anything. So then you, you have to push on this. It's worth the fight. What comes out of pessimism? Well, nothing comes out of pessimism. Yeah. Just uh, on top of that comment, uh, I just read an excellent anthology called Academic Impression with, with contributions from SU Purdue University people that emphasizes the corporatization oh, yeah. of the university. It's cor it, corporate is real. I mean, when you talk about corporatization of the university, of course, there have been books written about this that I'm sure you're aware of. Did you want to follow up on that? why professors, before they get tenure, uh, do not do anything active, because you'd never advise a teacher to do anything controversial before he gets tenure. Right. Uh, you're going to have a court case. You're gonna, you're not, your rights aren't, it's the, aren't very well protected, the stigma. But after you get tenure, They're cowards. The, the, the mystery. And, well, there are two different elements to it. Number one is that the, the it seems to me that hypocrisy is the great cloak of almost all other evil, and that is to say, yeah. your chancellor wrote to you once you exposed his yeah. hypocrisy of not writing. It's, yeah. They're very concerned about appearances. But the other level is that there's total freedom to control our salaries, to control our perquisites, to, to, make a, to deal with our course assignments. Right. Uh, there's no remedy unless chairs of committees uh, that deal with it stand up and, and do something about it. Well, that's, that's right. We have committees, as you do here at Berkeley, and I sit on the Committee on Research, and, and they're talking about, well, we really don't like long-distance learning, but maybe we should start a little project just to show what the uh, pluses and minuses are, even though 80% of the faculty don't want it. And I said, what are you talking about? Once you start a project like that, you've got people, you've got an industry started. They're going to want to keep their jobs, and they're going to want to expand it. So don't start it to begin with. If you're against it, just say you're against it. There's plenty of, plenty of evidence pro and con on that. Then I asked the question that you're aiming at, which is do we have any evidence that shared governance is shared? So we, we started at Berkeley, eight of us. I'm the only, the only social scientist on, on that committee on intercollegiate sports. We're not against intercollegiate sports. We just don't think that they should use academic monies to support them. They should support themselves. And it's been a lie. They've been saying for years, intercollegiate supports brings money to the university. It's a total lie. They're in, the, in debt something like $63 million that they never pay back. So we, we exposed that. You know what it took to get that data? Unbelievable. And we're talking about everybody's a, a hard scientist except me in this committee. So they're a computer scientist, and he gets his stuff back. And they say, no, you, you're just, you, you must be confused about that. He said, I'm not confused. I'm a computer scientist. I know how to compute. So we th then we got passed in the Academic Senate a uh, resolution saying that they should support themselves. You cannot believe th it's a two-hour faculty meeting. The guy that runs it is from the law school, a guy named Coots, and he was doing everything to make sure it didn't come up at that meeting because then you wouldn't have a meeting until spring. I mean, and so what, what did we do? Some anthropology professor, some social science professor, wasn't an anthropologist actually, some social science professor said, let the faculty speak, and everybody started saying, yeah, let the faculty speak. And then they had to cut the, cut the donor who was speaking off. Now, then what happened is the chancellor worried that this would get implemented or something, even though they, can't, they I mean, all of these stories are unbelievable. You know, from, if I was an assistant professor, someone told me universities did these sort of things, I wouldn't have believed it. The chancellor then appoints his own committee with alums, donors on it, and it's headlines in the San Francisco Chronicle. And I get interviewed, and what do you think? I said, slap in the face of the faculty. He doesn't even wait to the faculty committee. If the faculty can't even respond to a slap in the face, what are we doing here? I mean, we might as well be working in a factory. Maybe we are. So, but, you know, but it's worth sort of making the fight, and all of a sudden, they're getting nervous about transparency in numbers at Berkeley. 
and of course other places too. All of a sudden there are all these articles. All of a sudden David Zirin, who's a big sports writer in this country, you know, he's very interested in what's going on and he's just written a, a book called Bad Sports. So little by little by little, I mean, if you want a quick win, you're not going to get it. Incremental. Yes. Hi, I'm Dave Richardson. Hi. I'm an economist, but I teach a lot in democracy. Oh, great. And if I could return to one of your early points and ask you for some recommendations, I would appreciate it. I think your point about the American tradition of deemed personhood, deemed citizenship for corporations, is one that's been abused, clearly, over the hundred plus years that it's been in existence. Is there a constructive alternative to it? Someone who's thought out a law, a piece of legislation that would define rights of corporations independent of whether they're persons or not in the view of the Constitution. Right. And that would certainly return us to a much more bounded set of corporate rights right. than individual rights. Right. I, I bet that, uh, that Professor Ashford could give you some legal quotes, and I could also send you some legal citations. I could send you some material on that if you give me where to send it to. And I had one of my students do a historical study of how the corporation became a person, because it wasn't always a person in this country, little by little by little, and why, and what opposition there has been to it. So, yes, if you give me your address, I'd be happy to do that. You, you mentioned the uh, 2000 election and a third-party candidate and campaign. Do you think that campaign had anything to do with the fact that George Bush, rather than Al Gore, won? Which campaign? 2000. The I'm not understanding the question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, d d I thought you mentioned a campaign, the Ralph Nader's campaign in 2000. Right. And I'm, I'm, what I'm asking is, do you think the existence of that campaign had anything to do with the fact that George Bush, rather than Al Gore, uh, was the oh, winner? He didn't win. <laughs> In fact, Gore won. He won the votes. And, and it's a lie, and it was, uh, it was, he didn't win. And the other thing that never comes up is, who would vote for Gore and Lieberman? Lieberman is a right-wing whatever. So uh, a lot of people don't want to discuss the fact that he chose the wrong mate. I mean, are you kidding? Uh, just look at what's happened to Lieberman since. So, but I do think you're, you have something, a point that you're making that has some validity. That, that some people were so scared that uh, for one reason or another that it affected their vote. Lots of Democrats voted Republican in Florida. 100,000 Democrats voted Republican because they didn't want Gore Lieberman, right? And the, and the reverse probably happened in some places. It's, it's a black box still. Yeah. Hi, Professor Nate. I just wanted to thank you for coming here. Um, this idea of the corporate university that you're talking about is, um, has really hit home on this campus with a selection of a CEO as our commencement speaker this year. And it just has really made me question the legitimacy of our administration and our student body. And how, how, how do you stand behind your students when they don't agree with the choice that a university has made? Oh, I tell them to go and express their, I tell them it's a free country. Here's, a, here's an answer to your question by a law professor. If your students are unhappy with this choice, you ought to invite a speaker and go to an alternative program. Right. That's just that simple. Go there and vote with your bodies, and the larger it'll be, and you might get some publicity on that. If you're unhappy with that choice, Go to an alternative graduation. Stage it and do it. Don't they do. Be afraid. And don't be afraid. Yeah, they do that in lots of places. By, by the way, at Berkeley, the students pick the graduation speaker. So why don't you pick your own graduation? You can start that movement here and now. Yeah, start it here. Students, you're the ones that are graduating. Your parents paid the bill. Yeah.
No, but what it does is it calls attention to the problem. And the next step. Incremental, little by little. But, you lose an opportunity yeah. but the best thing to say is that students should pick their own graduation speaker. I, w I mean, I was the only woman ever been, uh, nobody, uh, at Wells College, for God's sake, the students picked the graduation speaker. And one year they picked me. And it was the only, it was the first time the women picked the woman, which is amazing in itself, 1970 something. But they were the one, they still picked the graduation speaker. And at Syracuse, if somebody else picks the graduation speaker, how antediluvian. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, in, um, in our legal system and uh, polit uh, uh, in our political system and legal system and even the economic system, and what actions do you think that governments should um, uh, should have to ensure the idea of democracy? For example, the people often claim that test is against the idea of uh, of democracy. So, what actions and policies should the government take? To um, for the progress and for the societies. Did you get that question, yeah. Professor? I can repeat again. Yeah, I, okay. I, I didn't quite get it. Did you get? I'm sorry. For the government actions well, and policy. Well, they ensure democracy by applying the law for one thing, and not evading the law, and um, that's what what. You see, the problem now with the law is since Justice Berger, it has been so deemed a problem. American law, I mean, he used to refer to American lawyers as, uh, uh, in the most negative terms. He was uh, the uh, Supreme Court justice. And there was this anti-law movement in this country in the 70s, a very strong, of which I was an observer and I've written about. So if you, if you, can't, if you don't have law, you don't have democracy. The only thing between us and fascism is the Supreme Court, basically. So you have to support the law, and you have to participate. And there are people that are fighting inside the system. I mean, look at David Cole, Georgetown Law School. He's done a lot. On, look at the people that are, that are working on the Patriot Act. And all, I mean, there are a lot of people working on these issues. But you, you should know about them. Uh, Amy Goodman reports on them a lot. So. Um, uh, OK. Um, okay, so um, I think there's one issue that the people claim, claim that test is against the democracies because when you when the government tests the peoples and the people will will say, well, I don't um, necessarily to pay the test, so I should have the democracy, I should have the liberties, so I do not need to pay the test. So what do you think about that? Well, maybe we should talk afterwards. Maybe we should talk after. Okay, sure. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm a student from Ukraine, and um, I've been in America only one year so far. But it seems to me that sometimes in this country, ensuring the law is almost like a trade-off between what you can afford and what you cannot afford. That's right. And, uh, you know, is that really the only way to ensure democracy in this country? Because it seems like every year the law is becoming more and more complicated and more and more costly because law practice is a business as well. You know, what's interesting about uh, Mexico and Latin America and European culture is very often uh, they, they got a, a first degree in law before they specialized in anything else. So everybody was literate in the law in the 19th century. This was just what you did. Here people are illiterate in the law. So they don't even know what their rights are. They don't know when they've been violated. And again, if you go back to the 60s and 70s, there were all kinds of people that came forward to work on exactly the problem you're talking about, either through class action suits, that, 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 that's very important. And then so they were successful, so they attacked class action suits and went after them. So you have to see where the dialogue has been within the legal, among the legal scholars themselves. And we could, I could elaborate on that. We'll probably need to start final questions. Uh-oh, thank you. Well, I'm happy to give the final question. Um, uh, actually, I'm Ghanaian, I'm Kwame, and um, I, I read this quotation by Judge Brandeis, which said that um, capitalism cannot coexist with democracy. Um, did you get my question? I'm sorry, capitalism is... Cannot coexist with democracy. Okay. What's your take on that, please? Um, as I said to start with, there's capitalism and there's capitalism. 
corporate capitalism cannot exist with democracy if it, if it controls government in Washington. That's, that's been observed and written about and it should be by now. But then there's this ideological thing that equates freedom and free enterprise as equivalent to democracy, which it is not. So in Europe, they have socialized medicine in quotes, socialized, but they have democracy. And they have a lot of other things that are government sponsored and so forth, but who's gonna say that England doesn't have democracy, right? In so far as we can. So it depends on how you're using the term capitalism as well.